This is uh, part two of the uh, introductory lecture, and I'm smiling because, uh, again, uh, the first time I'm doing this um, in this fashion and already uh, have been interrupted um, in the midst of my first lecture. It did cut off, I think, at uh, a relatively um, natural point talking about governance. Um, each of those uh, boards of trustee or each of those trustees on the board, I should say, um, respond or, or are under some scrutiny or observation by their constituencies. And those constituencies are multifaceted. Uh, the students uh, who attend the institution, uh, their families uh, who have students and are paying tuition uh, either uh, for a family member or themselves, uh, the political institutions in the state, the legislature, the governor's office, um, civic groups such as the Chamber of Commerce, all of those um, have an interest in a quality higher education in the state of Indiana. And uh, the board uh, is uh, representing those interests as they govern uh, the institution. Now, in thinking about the implementation of the policy set by the board or the president, you have then the president of the university and the president's senior staff, uh, the provost, uh, and then the vice presidents, the provost being the chief academic officer uh, of most institutions. So uh, shifting gears to uh, the law, and this again, we're, we're going up to 60,000 feet here. The law uh, finds uh, its agency, at least, uh, in several different sources. We have constitutional law, which we have the United States Constitution um, and the Indiana Constitution, um, an example of uh, a place where the impact of the U.S. Constitution is felt uh, very, very frequently in higher ed is with the First Amendment, uh, freedom of speech, um, free exercise of religion, the establishment cause in the First Amendment, uh, freedom of assembly. Each of those uh, has any number of issues that have arisen over the course of the last uh, 100 years or so uh, that involves uh, higher education. State constitutions, while less uh, frequent and less frequently involved in the world of higher ed, uh, are also uh, present and need to be attended to. Uh, that is, the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution gives it, uh, as it would, one would think, uh, supreme uh, governance over uh, any other uh, source of law. So, uh, for example, if the Indiana legislature passes a particular statute, a statute being a law, uh, that is enacted, and that statute somehow contradicts or runs afoul of the United States Constitution, uh, someone can bring suit, the institution uh, being a, perhaps an obvious candidate to, to file suit against uh, or bringing a statute to the attention of the court system saying, we think uh, that this particular statute or law passed by the state of Indiana is unconstitutional because it violates um, this particular provision of the United States Constitution or even the Indiana Constitution, for example. And in that case, if it was found to violate it by judges, uh, then that statute would be uh, stricken. And that's what's called the concept of judicial review. Uh, it's set forth in Marbury versus Madison originally by Chief Justice John Marshall, giving courts the right to review uh, statutes passed by the United States Congress or by any state legislature for constitutionality, whether or not they meet uh, the requirements of those formative documents, being the United States, again, Constitution, or the particular state constitution that governs um, the boundaries of that state. So that brings us to our second source of law, which I've alluded to, and that is statutory law. Statutory law is passed by a legislative body 
federal statutory law is passed by the United States Congress and then is signed by the president or vetoed by the president of the United States. If it's signed by the president, then it becomes a United States statute and is published in the United States Code. An example of a federal statute uh, would be uh, FERPA, um, the Family Educational Rights Act, um, which is a uh, statute which is frequently at issue in the life of, of higher education. Uh, it's also known as the Buckley Amendment, named after one of the legislators who was involved in its drafting um, several decades ago at this, time, at this point. A state statute is enacted by the state legislative branch. In Indiana, it's the Indiana General Assembly, which also has two houses, the Indiana Senate and the Indiana House. And then if the governor signs it, uh, it becomes a state statute. An example of a state statute that would affect higher ed would be the confidentiality of mental health records or counseling records. Um, and that statute is found in uh, Indiana Code uh, at, I believe, Title 12 and is sets forth uh, the rules uh, and circumstances under which uh, mental health records can be disclosed and establishes the, the general rule of confidentiality. The uh, judicial system in the United States, uh, we have both federal and state judicial systems. Uh, the federal judicial systems, uh, federal courts, have jurisdiction over federal questions. That is, questions arise that arise under uh, the United States Constitution or a federal law, uh, or they also have jurisdiction uh, in diversity matters where you have citizens of one state in a dispute with citizens of another state and the amount in controversy is greater than $75,000. So that's diversity jurisdiction under the federal court system. Every state also has its own state court system. And I was a state court trial judge uh, it has three levels. You have trial judges, um, intermediate appellate judges, and then Indiana Supreme Court judges. At the federal level, you have district judges, which are trial courts. You have courts of appeal, which are intermediate appeals. And Ball State sits for federal court purposes in the Southern District of Indiana, for uh, and that's our trial court district, and that sits in Indianapolis. And our intermediate appellate court district is the Seventh Circuit, which hears most of its cases in Chicago. And then the United States Supreme Court and Ball State has been there once in a case called Vance versus Ball State, uh, sits in Washington, D.C. Uh, so those are the two court systems um, at both levels, state and federal. And court systems can also be a source of law and that if you have a dispute, and I mentioned Vance versus Ball State for that reason, uh, she filed suit in the Southern District of Indiana. Ball State won at the trial court level, and then it went up on appeal to the Seventh Circuit, and those a three-judge panel on the Seventh Circuit issued a decision in Ball State's um, favor that was published. The analysis of that fact pattern that were, was developed during the course of that case uh, is set out in the decision and the judges then apply the law at issue to that fact pattern to give guidance not only to the litigants in that case but also to others who come after that situation who are able to read that case and determine if the fact pattern uh, with which they are dealing is similar to the one that's set forth uh, in the published decision, and then that case gives guidance uh, to parties as to how they should behave moving forward. Uh, the case then went up to the United States Supreme Court, where in a 5-4 to four decision, Ball State prevailed. And again, that case is also published, uh, giving guidance to subsequent litigants uh, who would have uh, a legal dispute or matter that was perhaps similar to the one involving Ball State. The same principle applies at the state court level. 
where intermediate appellate courts um, publish decisions, the Indiana Supreme Court publishes decisions, and then those decisions provide guidance and are a source of law. So now we have two sources of law, actually three. We have the Constitution, we have statutory law, and we have case law. Uh, case law is sometimes referred to as the common law, um, although uh, that is a bit misleading and that pure common law involves legal decisions that don't publish judicial uh, legal decisions that do not involve statutes. Um, so those are uh, the three sources so far. And then their administrative law. And an example of that would be uh, uh, the Federal Department of Education. Uh, they develop rules governing um, education, including higher ed, and those rules are set out in the Code of Federal Regulations, and they also govern uh, the affairs of uh, colleges and universities. At the state level, uh, there are also uh, governmental agencies, administrative agencies, and I, uh, using the same example, the uh, Commission on Higher Ed, and they will have certain rules that again appear in the Indiana Administrative Code that govern the affairs of colleges and universities. So that's our fourth source of law. We have constitutions, we have statutes, um, we have judicial or case law, and we have administrative agencies. Uh, or rules, and all of those exist on both the federal and the state levels. Uh, our final source of law uh, outside the university is our local uh, govern governmental entities. So Ball State sits in Delaware County and is subject to those ordinances that are passed by the Delaware uh, County Commissioners or within the city of Muncie ordinances that are passed by the city of Muncie. Uh, so those are, that's our fifth source of law. Then a sixth source of rules or obligations to which uh, administrators must abide or at least uh, be uh, certainly aware of and, and willing to address uh, if they don't want to get uh, crossways with the board, and that, are, that is uh, rules of the institution. Uh, at Ball State, you have a student handbook, and you have a faculty and professional personnel handbook uh, that governs uh, the affairs uh, internally of the university. So that's uh, another source of, of rules and law. So now we are on our seventh source of law, in quotation marks, at its broadest point, that govern uh, the affairs of administrators at colleges and universities. And uh, in the case of Ball State as a public institution, uh, it will have uh, added responsibilities that are not present at a private institution in that it is then going to be subject to the strictures of the Constitution. Uh, an example of that would be uh, for purposes of uh, the First Amendment, um, Ball State will be seen as an agent of the state of Indiana, and if they attempt to restrict free expression, and we'll cover this in much greater detail later on, uh, that uh, places Ball State squarely under the purview of the United States Constitution and the First Amendment to that Constitution, and also the Indiana Constitution, which also has a free speech clause. So those are our sources of law that uh, govern um, universities and colleges. Private institutions have a bit more leeway in that they are not seen as state actors and therefore have greater latitude when it comes to uh, certain behaviors uh, than do public institutions. Then in terms of um, litigation itself, uh, I've described to you the court systems. Uh, many of uh, the cases involving Ball State University are resolved by judges. They are not subject 
or have not been subject to per, uh, review by a jury, though on occasion any institution can be subject to uh, a jury case. Um, many of the in, uh, instances involving litigation involving that concern the university have been resolved uh, as a result of summary judgment, meaning that the trial court found there was no genuine issue of material disputed fact and that the court could enter judgment as a matter of law. And in many cases that's been in favor of the university uh, simply because um, the courts found that the, the plaintiff did not have a viable case, though not all. So um, that concludes uh, really uh, a high-level uh, review of the United States legal system, uh, sources of law within the United States, and uh, how those uh, sources uh, affect colleges and universities.